Welcome to this live conversation with Natalie de Morton. I am really excited to start this. This is going to be a bit of an impromptu series that I will do over time because I work on flow over force and when my intuition calls me to do something and I have a whole bunch of really fun conversations that I'm going to be having um, here with people and also on their podcasts and their places and all of the good stuff. So I will make sure you know where they all are, but periodically I will be inviting people on to have conversations. And I want to just say really specifically that this is much less of an interview and much more of let's chat, let's talk about our experiences, let's learn um, about you and hear a different perspective from a different person who's on this journey with us and on journey and doing all the things hey natalie i'm excited hi karen i'm adjusting Me too. third time i used my ring light and my whole setup so i'm feeling very professional right now <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing i'm good thank you yeah no really well yeah awesome this is all happening very well with technology probably because mercury retrograde regrets finished so good on us for our timing. Um, and I was just sharing about how this is going to be much more of a conversation than an interview. And so we're going to chat. I am going to ask some questions. We're going to, you know, start the conversation essentially. Um, and now I've just jinxed it, haven't I? Because I said it was going so well. And now we're just waiting for the connection to come back. Come on. Come on. We can do it. We can do it. Um, so while that comes back, I just want to introduce Natalie. I have a, a beautiful little bio. Oh, no, see, she's dropped off. Um, a beautiful little bio of Natalie's. Um, and so I will read that out to you. And then I also thought I would share and share a bio of my own because I don't think that I've actually introduced myself in a while and there's new people all the time. Um, and I was also chatting with a friend uh, the other day and she was like, I feel a little silly because I don't really know exactly what you do. And I was like, well, that's not your fault. <laughs> I'm like, that's me because I keep evolving and I keep changing what I'm doing. And sometimes I talk more about it than others. So allow me to introduce us. Um, so Natalie is a mama of three gorgeous souls, a lover of the outdoors, a physiotherapist, and has her own online health and wellness business. Um, Natalie completed her PhD from and postdoctoral studies in the area of exercise for older people and healthy aging. Fascinating. I want to know more about that. Um, she now balances working clinically part-time in her local community while raising her children and growing her online health and wellness business. So welcome. But also what I love about that is... I mean, you're doing all the things. You're not. You're doing what you're feeling called to do. Um, but the flexibility, right, where we can be raising our kids, we can have our online business, and we can be working part-time if that's what we desire, and we can blend it and flex um, with that. So let me do a quick bio for me. I'm just going to make this up on the spot, inspired by Natalie's, and then um, we will dive right in. Um, so I'm Karen Hewson. I am also a mama of two little ones. They are six and three. I have been on, I live in New Zealand. Natalie's in beautiful Australia. So we're going to have a little cross Tasman hangout. Um, <clears throat> I used to be a project manager and business analyst in corporate about seven years ago. Um, I finished up that too when I was pregnant and started my online business. And I have been on an evolution where I was very much that type A planner, uh, very structured, loved all of the productivity hacks, would just organize things down to the nth degree. Um, and I've been on a journey to the other side, to the feminine, to the flow, to trusting myself and connecting with my intuition through lots of things like human design and cyclical living. Um, and now I stand very firmly in the space I like to call intuitive self-leadership. So we are connecting into our intuition we are trusting ourselves and we are leading ourselves forward as we are called to do all of the fun, exciting things we are called to do. And they don't necessarily have to make sense and we don't have to explain them and we don't have to justify them. And we just get to be us and we get to connect with people and have conversations in really, really sacred spaces um, like I intend this to be 
and other spaces that we all create where we just get to be us and be welcomed as our whole selves. So um, that's a little bit about me, my journey, and so I create these kind of spaces and I um, work one-on-one mentoring women um, one-on-one. There will be group things, I'm sure, to come. Um, And yeah, I'm really excited to start off these conversations with Natalie. So hello. (laughs) Hello, Karen. It's great to be here. And yeah, Um, I learned a lot about you just hearing your bio. Thank you. Thank you. I know. It's the thing when you live your, this is why we're having these conversations too. We live our experiences. And a friend of mine also said the other day, like people meet us where we're at right now. They don't know all of this stuff we've done. We don't, they don't know the story of how we got here. And I think we can be a lot more attached to how we got here and the stories we tell ourselves about those um, than new people coming to us because they just, they see us as we are now. And um, because of the spaces we operate in and the people we connect with, they just accept that they're like, great. I love your energy right now. I love what you're talking about right now. Um, And I know that I've gone through a whole process of, releasing and um yeah deleting and archiving and letting go of a whole lot of things that I've created over six years of business through the evolution um so let's talk about you and I guess your evolution so do you have like a sort of starting point that you think of for your your journey when it comes to personal development and getting into online business and things Yeah, I think uh, in view of today's conversation, I was sort of um, thinking, where's the best place to start? (laughs) Um, And I I guess in terms of, I know you use the term um, old paradigm and new paradigm, and, you know, that's something that resonates for me quite strongly as well. And I think really probably the first 30 years of my life, I was very much in the old paradigm. Uh, You know, I had a very traditional upbringing. I... I was the eldest of two younger brothers, Um, you know, I was the conscientious eldest child who did well at school and didn't cause too much, you know, trouble for my parents, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, did well at school and I was a sporty kid, loved sport and I guess for me that was a big uh, drawing point for doing physio when I finished school, like studying physio, becoming a physiotherapist and uh yeah i think for me uh it was at at the time it was a great choice and 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 still is uh you know i I think i still love sport i still play basketball and when i finished school i played state league netball that was my passion at the time and i think you know it was just assumptions that we grew up with wasn't it that you know, you go to school, you do well. Uh, It was never explicitly said, you know, you'll go to uni and do a degree or two or three or, you know, whatever. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think that was just the trajectory that, you know, I followed. And, um, you know, I had a lot of success doing that. And, you know, I guess, you know, I went on to do my PhD after finishing. I worked clinically for quite a number of years. And, I loved the whole space of exercise and older people and that was something that I was really, um, you know, I worked in, I'll go back a step, when I finished my physio degree I went into one of the major public health networks in in Melbourne and that's where I worked and you went through all the different rotations of doing, you know, cardiothoracics, neurology, ICU, paediatrics, you know, I guess you got a really broad smorgasbord, if you like, of experiences and in a really supported environment so that, you know, invariably when things do happen in hospitals, you had other other people around you who were more experienced. And, um, yeah, but the thing that really resonated for me, which was, I guess, a surprise at the time because I went into physio thinking I love exercise and I'm going to be a sports physio and that was kind of what I had, I guess, mapped out or in my radar of thoughts and, yeah, it was a geriatrician who I was working with um, in the hospital and he, he was really interesting and I really, um, you know, we gelled well together and he got some funding from the state government uh, around, um, you know, that we could run a trial and I was really interested. Um, sorry, this is a long answer to your initial question, Karen. No, it's <laughs> This is partly why I love the conversational thing because I'm like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea that you had a PhD and, I mean, yeah. your story already feels so similar to mine about 
you know, this is the path. And yes. there's still breadcrumbs. Even through that, even through following the path that was laid out, that we were told, do this and you'll be successful, you'll be happy, you'll be financially stable. Like, there, there are still breadcrumbs. And I have a feeling you're getting to one of those breadcrumbs. So I'm excited. Please continue. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we really resonated around that and in terms of geriatrics and older people. And I guess the thing that was really obvious to me, like I'm a clinician at heart, like that's um, what drew me to physio. And I guess the natural progression in a lot of industries is that, you know, you kind of go off the tools as you work further up, you know, get more experience, you become the educator and the teacher and the lecturer and, um, but I guess my PhD question was a really clinically driven question in that I could see that older people were coming into hospital with their heart complaint or their chest condition, whatever it was. And, you know, they'd walk in with that condition, that they'd get their treatment and then the doctor would say, okay, you can go home now, but they couldn't get out of the chair to go home. So, you know, there was a clear piece missing in terms of the amount of therapy that people were receiving and the types of therapy. There were so many questions around it, what's safe to give when people come in with, you know, acute conditions and so many questions. So I guess that was where my, my study or postdoc or post my PhD research started was looking at, um, you know, well, what if we do give additional individual, individually tailored exercise to a group of people and see how they differ when it gets to that time point of going home. Uh, and, yeah, it wasn't surprising to find that there was a group that did a lot better. So um, the study actually got a lot bigger before it ended. We ended up running it across multiple healthcare networks in Melbourne and it became quite a big thing. So, um, yeah, but... Need I guess at the end point of it all, which was amazing, was that, you know, it informed clinical practice guidelines um, and best practice care in hospitals now, not just in Australia, but also overseas. So I think for me, you know, that impact piece was, mm. you know, just so rewarding and, you know, it was done really scientifically and, um, yeah, it was something that, yeah, I'm proud to have completed and it did go on to, to more work, which um, I don't know if... I, I should talk about that now, Karen, but... <laughs> go ahead, keep going. Yep, I will have a point which I'll be like, oh, let's go this way. But no, I'm loving it. Because um, at the end of it, of that study, I guess, what we found was that we know how important the physical health of people is. Like, it's such an important indicator of our health. It's like taking a blood pressure cuff reading, you know, it's that important. And... I guess unlike other important indicators of health, we, do, we didn't at the time actually have an accurate way of measuring that important health construct. So, which was quite a obvious but big revelation at the time. And so that was what I went on to develop was an instrument that was really soundly developed. I'm a numbers person, um, a bit of a numbers geek. Um, that had a really strong algorithm behind it and basically it became has become like the blood pressure cuff for physical health, if you like. So, And because I think it's all been very clinically driven, is it's had huge uptake and, you know, not just here but also overseas and um, in its paper format, like it's freely available and it's been translated into different languages. So I think... Um, yeah, in terms of success, um, you know, that was in terms of the topic of today's conversation, I guess, you know, that was certainly something that, you know, has been really huge for me and, you know, I put a lot into um, and, you know, I enjoyed the journey. I think mm. on reflection, looking back um, with what I know now, <laughs> um, and I think you referred to it in the introduction in terms of, you know, your feminine and your masculine energies as I think, you know, I was certainly working very much in my masculine energy a lot of the time. I didn't know much about energetics back then, nothing really. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't know about human design, which um, I'm sure we'll probably go on to talk about today. But I guess probably the closest we had in terms of, you know, understanding self in a, I guess, a, a formal sense was probably like your Maya Briggs. Is that something yeah. that you, you used? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's something that, yeah, we use a lot here in Australia and I, you know, imagine still probably is used in hospitals with staff who are me mentoring staff in their department. 
Um, but it never really resonated for me um, in a way that was really helpful. Like it kind of helped in the way that I was an INFJ um, from memory. And it kind of made me think, yeah, I think that's me. But it didn't actually help me to grow. Yes, it didn't help you to grow. Yeah, yeah. I was seeing that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm an INFJ as well. Are you? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And it, like you say, it's something where you're like, okay, cool. It gives you almost a common language with the people that you do it with. So you can start to understand the dynamic. Um, but I just had the thought when you mentioned that, like, how incredible would it be if like human design became the new Myers-Briggs and it was like used throughout like business and organization the same way that Myers-Briggs is because that would be, like you say, hugely valuable in understanding other people, how they work, how to support them, how to interact with them, and also give us a tool to grow and personally look at ourselves. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, have, I just think I have no idea how that would happen. But how with the knowledge that we have of human design, like yeah. that would be a really incredible space to be in. It would have a really interesting effect. Amazing. Um, yeah. I love all of that that you shared though because I I am blown away when I start to have these conversations with other women that I've just like I say randomly connected with on the internet it's all got purpose behind it as we know but like you say we've almost lived another life when we were in um you know that that traditional success path and we've all still I think done really well and also done amazing things and a lot of the time um I think once we get to exploring into what we do now, it's almost difficult to sort of claim and speak about those successes and those experiences um, in a really positive way because we know they're all kind of mixed up with the old paradigm, with the masculine. You know, it was hard work. We still did this incredible thing and we still feel very proud about it, but it's kind of jumbled up with like how it happened and what that time in our life represents I think um I had a similar thing where it was like you do well in school I was I was like in the group of people at high school who had the top grades but I wasn't like at the top but I was like in that in that group yeah. and um, I was in a lot of drama and I I left school in New Zealand early to start university because like that was the thing that would help me get ahead um and I, I had a moment where I, I kick myself about that now. Like I didn't do my final year of high school because it would have been just for fun, mm -hmm. uh, which I still can't say without like a little stab in the heart. Um, for for seven, 17 year old me, I'm like, do it just for fun. Yes. Now my whole yes. the reason to do things is just for fun. Um, but I did the degree and I, you know, got into I did an IT degree um and at the time because like you say I mean I'm 37 so this is like you know the first 30 years of our lives were in this in this bubble and I um went and did the career thing and like got married got the house had the career went traveling overseas like tick 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 ticking the yeah. boxes um and then yeah I know that I really got to that point where I was like Partly, I think, coming home from overseas and having children and having maternity leave like we do in New Zealand, I, I always had a side hustle, but that gave me an opportunity to say, you know, how can I make this work? And that was kind of a really big shift um, for me. So was there a time through your journey where you kind of started to introduce the online business or get exposed to personal development and you kind of opened up a little bit of space for, for that part to come in? Yeah, I think that came later. I think for, for me, it was probably at the end of it all, I would say, because I was in my masculine a lot of the time, I was relatively burnt out, I would say. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think now, you know, what do I teach to my kids about, you know, that that's the beautiful part, isn't it? We can teach them at such a young Absolutely. age now. Um, you know, to know what I know now would have been so useful back then. It's, it's not a regret. I love that I'm learning it now, but I also love that I can teach teach the kids. Um, yeah, it was it was later on. I think for, for me it was probably we had a fairly long journey to have our first child. And mm -hmm. so I think for us once, you know, we knew that Isabella, our eldest, was coming, um, it was very much I think that was a big turning point for us as, 
you know, I guess we knew our values and we wanted to align with those and maybe I didn't have the words for it back then, perhaps. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was very much, well, how do we want to do this? You know, we've both been very inv invested in our careers and, um, you know, we, we want to spend time with her <laughs> and how do, we, how do we do this? And my husband grew up down at the beach um, and we met in Melbourne. He moved to Melbourne um, when he started working and... Um, yeah, so I think for us it was really a point in time where we thought, well, if we can make the move seaside, we'd love mm -hmm. to do that. So he started applying for jobs and it all just kind of, it's amazing how the universe works, but he got yeah. a job down here that started four weeks after she was born. So mm -hmm. we um, moved three weeks after she was born. and. Oh. Safe. So you moved with like a brand new baby. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it was beautiful. Like it really was. And I think, you know, I just loved that we just went slow lane, you know, it was, um, it was amazing. And it was probably to answer, I guess, your question, it was really probably after we had our youngest that, and we knew that we weren't having any more, like we were, we were done. Um, you know, it was sort of, well, how am I going to, to do this in a way that's going to be true to me mm. and to balance being the mum I want to be, but also knowing that I'm someone who loves to, um, I'm creative, I'm ambitious, you know, how do I feed that side of me and do it in a way that, you know, you can have it all, but not... But not do it all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and that was when I, a friend of mine um, or someone who I met through basketball, uh, yeah, I got introduced to, to Arbon, which is the online um, business that I run. And, yeah, that's been two and a half years that I've been doing that. And I guess for me it was really at a point in time where there were class actions happening overseas with various products and I guess becoming a mum, you become, well, I became very mindful of the products I was using and the cleanness of them and what I was putting on the kids and so I loved the products in that they were clean and plant-based and, you know, allergen-free, all that sort of thing. And, yeah, but it ticked the box of being, you know, from your phone, it was flexible, you could really time it, you know, to please yourself essentially and it could fit in the nooks and crannies of your day. And, yeah, so that was kind of where that entrepreneurial side kicked in and it, it fit, I guess it fitted in that health and wellness space as well, which aligned with, you know, uh, my physio work and health and wellness, which has always been a passion as well. So, Absolutely. I think it's so interesting how for a lot of women, I feel like having children is becomes that interrupt for our lives and it becomes one of those like pivotal, it, just those triggering moments it's, it's obviously it's never one thing but it just starts this cascading effect and some of the things that have come to me while you're talking with around that is you know as women we have a monthly cycle and we bleed every month but I think society's kind of boxed that away we're like that happens so often in a way that we're like okay, no, this is how we're going to deal with that and we're going to make sure it doesn't interrupt the way that we want to operate, which yeah. is very reliable and consistent and daily we show up the same way because men's hormones operate daily. There's very, like, it makes sense as to how this has all happened. Um, but then when it comes to pregnancy, <laughs> like, when you're pregnant, your body, like, you're just along the ride. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone has different experiences, but it's very much like, you're pregnant and your body is connecting in to that kind of cyclical energy that like life giving energy, you're like literally creating a human being birthing a soul from, we don't even know where into being um, that you can't, it's very, it's a lot harder to ignore that. Like we have monthly yes. practice kind of trying to suppress and ignore our connection. And we start from a very young impressionable age, but I find I'd, yeah, I'd like to know your thoughts as well, because I feel like once we become, when we become pregnant, we go through pregnancy, we have a newborn, um, we, we are in this bubble where our bodies are shouting so loudly at us for what it needs and what it wants to be able to birth life, um, that it becomes very, well, very hard to ignore, but also we don't want to because if, it, if we ignore it too long, it becomes really uncomfortable and not a nice experience. Yeah. Um, so I think that 
because of where we're at, that connects us in to that intuition that we have. It starts, it, it just starts a little process that if, if we are open to it, like you say, if we're creative, we're ambitious and we know, there's a part of us that knows the way we want, the type of mother we want, the type of family we want, the type of life we want to have with our children. Like we didn't go through whatever we all went through to have children just to see, like, just to see them on evenings and weekends. <laughs> like, that's yeah. not the idea. Um, so, yeah, I'd love your thoughts just on that around, because I know um, cyclical living and we can get into all of that, but I'd just be interested to know how that resonates or what that makes you think of. Mm. I think for me the cyclical living um, component really kicked in around the time when I started personal coaching. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that was uh, where, I mean, I think looking back, I was intuitively to some extent following my cycle, but it wasn't really until I started coaching and really learnt a lot about it. And parts of it, it was embarrassing. I found it embarrassing that I didn't know a lot of that stuff. And I was, you know, 40 years of age. It was like, how have I got to this point? I'm nearly approaching yeah. menopause. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah, just so much um, depth and so much, yeah, I just loved learning about it in terms of mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you say, it helped me to tune in. I'm naturally an intuitive person, um, but it just took my intuition to another level. Um, and I guess trying to time things with my cycle and what a difference it made um, to your way of life. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I it, the cyclical living stuff was the very first thing that sparked me on this whole journey <laughs> uh, because I'd still be very much trying to force it and do it the masculine way and make the plan and take the action and do it when it didn't feel like it um, and then I read Do Less by Kate Northrup and she talked about the phases of our cycle and about the flow and about um, it's I mean it's I don't want to say it's brief she has like a chapter or two on it it's not like the whole book it's just part of that but that really um that was obviously what I needed to hear at that time. And I, time is a strange thing. I feel like I ended up reading that much earlier when I was still having my babies, but it was really after my son was born. And yeah, we got the sense after two that it's like our family is now complete. This is what we're supposed to have. So we're not planning on any other children. Um, and so it was when my period came back after having my son and I'm like, I, I want to have a different experience <laughs> with my period going forward from this point. I don't want it to be what it used to be. I don't want it to be this annoyance. And I, you know, I have scratched the surface now that there's a whole lot of potential here. Um, and now I legitimately like love when I start bleeding, mm. which st it's still Me very too. odd to say. And yeah. it's still like, yeah, but I, I love it. I love that that time and being able to embrace the time of just becoming still and going inward and sitting with it. And um, yeah, there's, there are phases that can support us. And I find it really interesting if we just to, to make sure we touch on it briefly and keep chatting, um, you know, the four phases are just like the seasons. And so just like we operate, um, you know, seasonally, we bring that into the month and we actually already are doing that, during the day and during the week, because that is what, um, you know, men more naturally, um, their rhythm is more natural like that. So, you know, springtime is your morning, you wake up, it's new beginnings, it's fresh. Um, summertime is like lunch, you take a break, you do like active resting, you go have lunch with someone, you socialize, you kind of stop and clear your head and take a walk or whatever. Um, you know, the autumn is the afternoon when you're, you know, finishing up stuff that you did earlier that day, or you're like doing that burst of productivity before you, you know, knock off for the evening. And then of course the evening's the winter time when you rest, replenish and wait for the next day. Um, and I just, I'm like, we're already doing this. We already know how to do this. Yes. It's just that we, um, it's really not encouraged or taught or reinforced that we can operate like that on more of a monthly basis mm. than a daily or weekly basis. So, um, 
Yeah, I love all of that. So if you're listening and you want to know more, uh, me and Natalie can talk about this forever. So just ask. <laughs> we, we can continue the conversation um, in DMs or if you want to come into um, my new group, Experiencing Success Conversations, that's where we want to just have these all the time about everything we're curious about to keep all of our journeys um, expanding. But tell me about... Um, when you did start coaching and how that sparked, because you and I, um, well, I've worked with Unhurried Sage before, and I think you still are working with her, and mm. she's magic. She'll activate the heck out of you. So <laughs> tell me, yeah, tell me about how you, like, what happened before, what was, what got you into sort of the coaching relationship and sort of mm. <laughs> how that your mind, because I'm sure it did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, to be honest, it was a world that I didn't even really know existed until last year. It's um, quite amazing to, like, what are we now, October? So literally, yeah, about this time last year, I started some one-to-one -one coaching. And, um, yeah, that was where I guess I learnt um, about the cycles with Sherelle Freeman and, um yeah, learnt about cycles and a few, I guess, you know, masculine and feminine energy. And then, um, you know, I did a masterclass of Angarids in, must have been about May like, this year. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she's a powerhouse, isn't she? Amazing. And, you know, I love her dearly. And, yeah, it's just been an amazing journey, I guess, working with her. And, um, yeah, I've done a lot of her classes as I, or programs, as I know you have, um, you know, she has so many and being a one-to-one -one client, you get to, I guess, yeah, do any of the programs, which um, is just, I've loved doing that. Um, yeah, so that's sort of been my, um, this year has been a massive year of personal growth and also um, spiritual growth as well. And, you know, uh, and Garrett is a manifester, as you know, and incredibly activating and yeah, I guess the reason I started personal coaching, which um, looking back, it's quite funny now really to think it was really that my uh, online business had plateaued, you know, I'd done really well, but it had sort of stayed fairly flat for a while. And I thought, you know, well, what am I going to do? And that was why I sought out personal coaching. And I guess it's been that, but so much more, like all these things we've talked about today, like, you know, cyclical living, masculine and feminine energy, human design, which I just, you know, love. Mm -hmm. um, and meeting and working with people like Angarid, who, you know, are just amazing humans to have in your life. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a massive journey and, you know, a lot of it's, you know, tough stuff, isn't it? I mean, I know you've, you've been down that journey. It's, you know, a lot of peeling back the layers of who you are and, you know, healing layers and all sorts, yeah, just, um, yeah, massive, but, you know, the growth on the other side is phenomenal and, yeah, I've, I've, I've loved it and still still do. <laughs> it's so exciting and I think um, I always love hearing how people get connected in because it is, it'll be, it'll be something that, um, it'll be something that allows us to take that step. So, like, for you, you were like, okay, where you were sitting before where it was probably still quite masculine led and you're like, right, I've plateaued. I need to do something different. I need to get support. Like you could talk about that to a lot of people and they'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like, that makes sense. It's like, yeah, for right then that made sense to your human to take those actions and now <laughs> we're you into this magical world. Um, because yeah. this is obviously like where you're meant to be and the people you're meant to be connecting with and helping and, and your story showing Showing people, and I, I really love how um, how we've shared our ages as well because I'm 37, and um, it seems odd. I mean, I still feel I don't age as a number; it's very odd. Um, but I know that for me, seeing other mentors who are in their 40s, I'm like, great, because there's an example of somebody older than me, like doing what I'm doing, parenting older kids than me, like hashtag mum goals, yes. and just having this gorgeous impact and showing us an example of someone in their 40s doing things this way because we very much are um, like, well, the first kind of wave of people operating differently like this. And so there aren't a lot of people that are older. So 
whether you're younger or older, it doesn't matter. I have examples for like every, <laughs> I have an example of a beautiful coach, Taylor Lee, who I've loved for a long time. And she started coaching when she was like 20 and she was really scared to talk about her age because she was so young. And, you know, who would work with someone who doesn't have that experience? And it's like, well, not by traditional means, but yes, you do. You're here for a reason. The conversation is what matters, like the perspective, the insight, the, the experience you do have that other people don't like. That's what matters. Um, and I had a different point, but apparently that was, <laughs> that was my point. Um, so I really love that. And I mean, you touched on things like, um, like going into menopause, like I'm actually, I'm sure I'll change, but I'm actually really excited. Like anytime people I follow talk about perimenopause, there's actually information available about that mm. there didn't used to be information mm. you just kind of waited until it got uncomfortable enough that you said something to your doctor i assume mm. and then i got a pat on the hand or something i don't know but it's it feels to me again like such an opportunity to raise the awareness and stay connected with our bodies um and be able to do these things so it's really it's really fun like you say a year ago it was so, so different. And yes. I know I almost said the masterclass last year because there's stuff I did in March and February that I'm like, that was last year though, not this year, <laughs> because it, it, it would feel like we, we operate and, and do so much. Um, really? Okay. I feel like there's another, I feel like there's another question. Um, you touched on, I think the peeling back the layers. Mm -hmm. um, and I've really noticed for me, like my new normal, is that I, I have this like heightened sense of awareness and I know what it feels like to be very clear and expanded. And even if I'm tired or, you know, duality, we do all the things, but I know what it feels like when my energy is clear and I'm open. And I know what it feels like when I'm being triggered or when my energy's off and I'm like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And it's essentially my new normal now where I, I look at that, I have that awareness and I'm like, okay, what is going on? And like you say, we dig into it. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit, like you say, now versus like a year ago, like how do you kind of operate, like rather than doing things, but how do you operate? How do you like, in, it is that embodiment, it's that being, yes. that kind of look like at the moment for you? Mm, no, that's a, an amazing question. Um, and I think, you know, that's really <clears throat> In terms of growth and, I guess, uh, you know, the whole term of alignment, which I guess we're mm. learning about human design. I'm not sure. What's human design type of you? Are you? I know. I was like, we've not shared. I'm a <laughs> super generator. I'm a 4-6. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're very shared for all of the human design people reading, listening. Yes. <laughs> I'm a 5-1 mental projector. Um, ah. And so I only, yeah, it would have been, yeah, late last year that I found that out for the first time. And I guess it, it, it does, exactly. It feels like a time warp in that it seems, and what is time, but, uh, you know, in terms yeah. of, like, so much has happened since then in terms of my own personal growth. And a lot of that has been, you know, aligning with that, um, with my human design type. I just love human design. I think, you know, it it's helped me so much in terms of, I mean, it's always a dance, isn't it, with your masculine and your feminine energies, but just it explains so much about me. And, you know, when I look back now on, I guess, you know, I've always naturally assumed the mentoring role at work, you know, I became the clinical mm -hmm. educator, I became the manager who, if someone was upset, they'd come to me or, you know, like I was the one with lots of students when I finished my PhD, you know, I always, and I loved that role. Um, mm. And I guess that's probably a, an example of where the Maya Briggs just doesn't explain stuff like that. And, you know, I liked the Maya Briggs at the time, I'm not trying to can it, but I guess in terms of human design, where it I guess for people on here who don't know much about it, it's basically your energy blueprint from when your time of birth, time and place of birth, essentially. And yeah, it's got quite a sophisticated underpinning to it. But um, I guess, yeah, it really explains there's five different groups of types, isn't there? So yeah, as you said, Karen, you're a generator, I'm a projector. And I guess it's all about your aura and your energy and how you interact with the world and how essentially the world interacts back with you. So, um, yeah, so I guess as a projector, um, you know, our aura is one that tends to 
be able to, I guess, pierce into other people's auras and we can see their soul fairly clearly. And I guess from a mentoring perspective, you know, if you can see someone fairly clearly, and sometimes it might be more clearly than they can see themselves, depending on who it is. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean that kindly, you know, it might be quite a junior new staff member or, you know, um, but, you know, in terms of helping them to develop themselves, you know, you can see edges for them and you can help them to work towards those. And I guess I didn't have those words back then, but I think it's interesting just looking back that, yeah, how much it explains about who I am and in terms of, you know, your ongoing evolution and growth, you know, it's a tool that you can use to continually do that. And I love that every week, you know, I'm still learning new things about it and I'm starting to, yeah, like your gates and, um, you know, leadership gates and learning about my husband. He's a splenic manifester. Mm -hmm. And I just had a reading done on the kids by Anne Garrett um, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm just delving into the parenting side of it, um, which, yeah, I just, I was so excited to get the kids done as well. Like Simon and I had ours done maybe about, I don't know, three months ago. But yeah, I had the kids done just recently and I was so excited to get that done. Absolutely. I mean, I've looked up my husband's and my kids human design and the, oh, there's, there were just like a couple things in my relationship with my husband where understanding that he has a defined center and mine is open explained this whole dynamic that was going on. And I'm like, oh, I mean, this is a theme. I have quite a lot of open centers. And so a lot of the stuff that I have carry isn't mine. And I have thought my whole life that it is. And so it really, really allowed me to interact with him differently, like to understand that. And he, um, I mean, I mentioned things around human design, but I probably do need to kind of, I don't know, get him a reading or have, sit him down and be like, okay, this is what it actually is. This is what it means. So I just make these off the cuff comments and he's like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but it does really, it's helped me. So as an example, um, my husband and both my children are emotional authorities and yeah. I am not an emotional authority. Yes. So essentially what that means is that I can take on and amplify their emotions. Mm. Um, doesn't feel so great when they're like not even yours, but you, it, it's useful, right? Especially like as a mother with children to be able to really sense what your kids are going through and stuff. But when you can't differentiate between that being their emotion versus that being yours, yes. you handle it completely differently. Mm. Um, and also that made me realize why I need like actual time where I am separate to them. Like I'm in my own energy where their energy isn't in my room or whatever mm. space that is. Um, so it's just little things like that. That's like, Oh, that's why that is. Oh, that's why that is. And mm -hmm. it, it's that confirmation. And like you say, giving your, giving yourself words and concepts so that you, your human conscious brain can understand things in a way that brings it on board with kind of what you already know, but yeah. you, you can't articulate it. And so it doesn't land and integrate in the same way. Mm. Um, so yes, if you, um, if you're watching the replay or you're on with us, you can let us know your human design. If you are interested to know more, um, what's the one that I like? I think it's my, my human design.com. Um, there's a couple other places as well. Mybodygraph.com is really good too. And like Nat was saying, you just enter in your birth date, time and place. And um, astrology is a big foundation. There's the I Ching and there's the chakras. There's like three or four different um, modalities like that are already quite established that have blended together into human design to give all sorts of magical insights for us to work through as in, as in when we need. Um, but yeah, human design and cyclical living, masculine, feminine energies. Um, any other like topics that have been like really big shifting your understanding? Those are definitely three for me as well. Um, yeah, they're, they're definitely probably uh, in terms of manifesting. That's probably another one that's been um, mm. and working with a manifesto coach um, being Angarid, um, who, who's my, my mentor. You know, it's just... Um, yeah, learning this, like learning to manifest from a manifester in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a non-specific manifester and, you know, just, I guess, learning how to manifest in a more individually tailored way um, 
for me. So, you know, if you're, you're trying to manifest, you know, my daughter wants to get a cat. <laughs> it's like, you know, she wants it with white stripes and a black nose. It's just, you know, well, it's just the cat and it's the energy and the vibration behind it for me rather than the details of date and time or amount of or, you know. Um, and I think probably learning something that I've loved learning about, like I guess the law of attraction is very well known, isn't it, in terms of, um, you know, you're trying to raise your vibration to meet the vibration of whether it be, you know, the, the job you want or the partner or the house or the yeah mm -hmm. business, whatever, um, to be a match for it. And I love the analogy that um, Angara uses. You know, she talked about a spoon, you know, with law of attraction, you're trying to get the spoon to bend towards you. Um, we actually it. watched The Matrix the other week, but proceed. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> um, so essentially getting the, the universe to bend for you. And and then she talks about the universal law of assumption, which, you know, yes. we go through life with these, I guess, well, for me, you know, old paradigm assumptions, you know, that you will finish school and you'll go to university, you'll meet a partner, have you know, you have all these sort of mm -hmm. assumptions and they do precipitate and it, it, mostly. Um, yeah. And I guess now if we look at it as a, we look at it, I'll get the wording right, that if we choose our assumptions prospectively, that we can precipitate our desires into our three-dimensional world mm. by embodying that, that yeah. it's happened in another timeline and we embody it now. So basically that our inner world, we're wanting to project outwardly, yeah, and manifest. So... I didn't word it as well as she does, but I just loved No, that's that. actually, I'm really excited you mentioned that because um, I think it was on the masterclass that Anghara did that's still, I think, on her IGTV. Um, maybe I'll pop in her handle in comments because we love her and we will reference her. And she, it was when she, she's had a million dollars this year which is magic and an expander, and I love it. Um, it was on that masterclass, and that's when she very much talked about it wasn't law of attraction that got her to the million dollars. It was the law of assumption. And I hadn't, I hadn't heard that before, and listening to that masterclass, it just... I, I feel like I've been taken out of the matrix and put back in again and I can see all the layers and I'm going through that integration this week. Yeah. Um, and I think that with one of the sparks or one of the pieces of it where... I start to see all of the little like assumptions and it's again, raising our awareness because once we have the awareness, we can see it, we can change it. Yeah. And right. Like I've, I've, I've got a busy time months in my life at the moment. And I could tell last week I was, you know, waking up and I was thinking the day is going to go like this. This is how I'm going to feel today. And I'm like, well, that's an assumption. I've not experienced this day yet. I don't know how it's going to feel, but like you say, you're absolutely projecting and assuming. And I think, you know, waking up and assuming the day is going to go a certain way is something very relatable that a lot of us do. And even if you just start there to raise your awareness, you can start to see other things. And like you say, it's those assumptions around, oh, I'm just, I'm going to leave school and, and go to uni because that's what I, that's what people do. That's mm. the success. Ah, that like matches the identity that I have and the expectations that other assumptions other people have about me. Yes. Um, so that masterclass, and there was something else I was going to reference of hers that completely. Oh, she went live this morning with an interview all about embodying wealth and like, yeah, embodying that before you have it. So when you want more, essentially, when you want more money to keep it really like relatable, but you don't have it yet. How do you start to match that vibration and how do you start yes. to manifest that? Um, and I only caught a bit of it before I had to jump off onto a call, um, but it was really good. And again, she, she speaks about, oh gosh, now I can't remember the exact concepts, but that's another one where, um, you know, the person interviewing her was speaking very much to like, you know, what, you know, what, you want to work with these high-end mentors Obviously, they charge high-end prices because that's amazing. But you don't—you're not necessarily at that level to work with them there. And you know, what do you do when you 
quote unquote can't afford it. We know that's not really a true concept, but like what is the path? And so I think that's another resource around manifestation, law of attraction, law of assumption. Um, if people are curious, I think that's going to be another great one to watch. And your actual answer to that that question about like how do I, you know, how do I progress when I can't afford it? is like there's a lot of free resources out there. Yes. And yeah, I've just mentioned two of them. Like um, that's why I love doing stuff like live streams and conversations and, you know, my Facebook group for the conversations is free. Like I I have used a lot of those kind of resources on my journey um, to learn about things and to grow and, and books. And even when I have chosen to work with high-end mentors and do different programs, like um, payment plans for a long time were what made them accessible. And so, um, yeah, I, I strongly, strongly believe that like the support that we desire is available to us with the resources we have available now. Um, we just need to, we need, we need to believe that and then we see them because we are open to the possibility. So, um, and I, yes. I, think, I think too with the, the um, manifesting pieces, it doesn't necessarily have to be for the really big stuff. You know, it can be for smaller things in your life too, can't it? So, you know, I had a classic the other day, like I love integrating this stuff into my parenting. And we were, oh, yeah. I don't know if they have this in New Zealand, but at the supermarket they often have like little, um, you know, for every, I think it was every $30 you spend at the supermarket, you get a toy, you know, and the kids love them. And, I think in the set there were 40 and the kids needed four more to get to the set. And so in the car, we were on the way there, we were talking about exactly this. And, you know, essentially my oldest daughter was Matt trying to manifest <laughs> getting um, and out of the four that they got, she got two of them, which was amazing. So it was just, um, it was a great, that was a Monday actually, but that's one of the most beautiful parts of this, isn't it? That your own growth goes, you know, so much further than just yourself. I love that we are teaching our kids that. And I mean, I, you know, as a mum, and my kids are six and three, like they're still quite little. Like I'm still, it's a big part of our lives when they're that age. I mean, they always are, but it takes up a little bit, a little bit more of our time. And um, I love that we are teaching them this. Like I tell my daughter when she's, when she's arguing with her brother and they both come running in and he tells like his version of the story. And she's like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, okay, what is your truth? What do you know to be true? And she's like, okay, I know I didn't do it. It's okay. Yeah. And I'm like, right from six years old, bringing her back to what does she know is true? Yeah. I mean, I can't even, mm. I can't even comprehend the it's like knock on mm. that that's going to have mm. for her. But realizing that that's something we get to do, um, and even um, I'm in the local theatre production of Greece. We start performances mm. on Wednesdays. We yeah. Very but a lot of the um, people in the cast are young. They're like late teens, early 20s. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm not generally around that age group. I'm not usually exposed to that age group. And just to see them, especially when we did like the first read through of Greece, set in the 50s, like is not mm. people. It is not PC at all. At one point, Danny turns to Sandy and says, why won't you just smile? And I have to say the gasps around the table from the, <laughs> from the younger kids, I was just like, I love this so much. Like that is no longer acceptable. That is no longer okay. And they're just like, <gasps> like oh, damn. And like having not been like, interacting with that sort of age group, I'm like, this is already happening. There are already so many um, like adult humans, people, um, who are moving this sort of, um, perspective forward and this like respect and love and different way of relating to each other. And, um, it makes me so happy that we can do it for our kids, that it's happening around us. Yeah. Um, and even, like I said, one of the other mentors that I follow who has teenage kids, you know, her kids' friends follow her. And love her and love that she's so positive about things and love everything yes. she's speaking about. And we can, that's what I mean by like hashtag mum goals. I'm like, that's, I'd love to be that for my kids' friends. And yes. have just, like you say, that ripple effect. Because whoever, um, whoever we are supporting and connecting and sharing with, that they have people that they're connected with. And yes. um, 
a lot of the times we can feel the fear and we can feel limited and overwhelmed and we can see all the bad things, but there is this ripple effect happening and we are part of that and it's, it's going to keep impacting people and lives. That's what, that's what I love. And that's what I love about connecting with you and connecting with other women and just having conversations, learning about each of us, our own journeys and experience and learning about all the stuff we're really passionate and excited about and working through um, and having aha moments about because it all just helps us all expand and feel loved and connected and supported. So is there anything else that you would like to say um, before we wrap up? No, I think we've covered a lot of territory. We have, I know, and I could speak for probably an hour on each thing that we spoke yes. about. So um, anyone watching now, watching the replay, if you are interested in anything else, just drop a comment and we can connect with you. We can point you at resources, whatever, because um, it's also fun and interesting. Um, how can people find you or where do you live and hang out around the internet if people want to be in your space and your energy some more? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I hang out largely on Instagram, so uh, at Healthy Happy Love with Nat. Um, yeah, that's that's my main 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 spot. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, me too. I've got Instagram, and like I mentioned, I've just opened this morning a new Facebook group about having more of these conversations. So I'm going to link this in here, but there's already a group of women like starting on this journey, already like in it. Um, so if that is also you and you want to chat more about what we've talked about today, or you'd just like a space where you can share this part of your journey with other people who get it, um, then you are welcomed to join us. Um, the link's in my bio. It's called Welcome to the Conversation, which I think is super cute. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Natalie. This has been so fun. I have it loved has. it. Me too. Um, and we will we will catch you on Instagram. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Go have a beautiful day to you and to everybody. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a great You're day. You're welcome. Bye.